Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to call this policy session to order. We start off with council information and follow-up requests. Um, anyone have anything? Vice Chair? Uh, thank you. So, important to note, these meetings are taped. So if you're watching this some other day than Tuesday, October 9th, disregard what I'm about to say. So, fair warning. Um, tonight at uh, 6 p.m. at the Paradise Valley uh, uh, Community Center, which is at 40th Street and Bell, just north of the high school on the west side of the street. Uh, again, I think I said north of Bell Road. Um, we're gonna have a meeting with the Water Services Director uh, at 6 p.m. so you can come ask questions and so forth but remember that's only for tonight the day that this is being heard October 9th if you're watching it live come one come all if you're watching this on tape someday after October 9th unless you have a time machine please don't uh, just disregard that last message thank you Absolutely. yes mayor thank you so this Thursday, we have our weekly District 5 community office hours. We'll have our office hours um, in the evening this time just to be more accessible to community members who work and can't come out to the morning hours. Uh, again, at the Maryville Community Center, 51st Avenue, just south of Campbell from 5 to 6.30 p.m. That's this Thursday, October 11th. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman DeCicio. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I want to thank everyone for coming out to the meeting today. Uh, I have a few announcements. Um, Today is the last day to register to vote. November election is today. Uh, Jim's part is taped. This is live, so just remember that. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. But uh, today's the last day to register. If you're getting this message today, Tuesday, um, hopefully you're registered by now. If not, you're going to have a hard time uh, being able to vote in the election coming up. Hope that everyone can register. Uh, this is still Domestic Violence Month. Um, Councilman Williams, myself, Councilman Nowakowski, I think he, uh, he was here on that. We're really active, uh, Councilman Waring as well. Um, matter of fact, we did a billboard together, Mayor, on that, you know, that people saw. And so this is a real important month for us as a state, as a city, and as a public too, because of the things that go on in our families sometimes, and we just gotta be very careful. But we've also, um, just make sure that we're aware of what's happening in our neighbors. It's, you know, if you think that there's something going on in a neighbor, feel free to report it. I think this is a, a real problem we have in our community. It, it's nationwide, actually, it's around the world. But it's, uh, we also have the Paint Phoenix Purple Donation Drive next Thursday from 6.30 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. It's gonna be at Indian School Park. Bring items like full-size toiletries, feminine hygiene, um, brushes, diapers, socks, underwear, anything that you can provide and donate if you're willing to do that. There are a lot of families out there that would love to have these types of things that are, you know, a lot of them can't afford to have. And so if you could bring some uh, donation, donated items, I think that'd be fantastic. Uh, we have some gain events coming up in my district, I know we do. Uh, we have a big one this Saturday uh, for the Arcadia Neighborhood Association. It's gonna be at the Schemer Art Center, which is right on 50th Street in Camelback. All people are invited to come. You just don't have to live in the neighborhood. Matter of fact, this is one of the larger and bigger gain events. It's fantastic that's out there. Um, we're gonna encourage people to come out there, bring your you know, meet and greet, get to know your neighbors. Uh, Cody Williams, years ago, would always call this the Go back to the nosy neighbor where you'd have somebody that would always be peeking out their window. It's actually a good thing for a neighborhood for at least one person to be in the neighborhood that's always aware of what's going on. I've got one of those, but I won't mention her name. Her and I are really good friends, but she'll text me at all hours of the night. Did you know there is a car? <laughs> you know, one of those things. I love the fact that she does that. Uh, she's amazing, actually, and she does this for the entire neighborhood, lets us know what's going on. It's great, and if we had more than one person doing that, it's even better. She also happens to have cameras everywhere. She'll send me pictures of people coming to my door. I've got ring, but she actually wants to make sure she sends it from the neighborhood and she can take pictures of the cars that are out there. Um, that's this week, and then also, we've got um, this Saturday, it's the Greater Orangedale Neighborhood Association, and that's gonna be from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m., and that, the address on that is 2150 North 46th Street. So we have two big gain events coming up this weekend. The following weekend, next Saturday, is the Ocotillo Neighborhood Association at Ocotillo and 10th Street. 
and they've got their gain event happening, and that's going to be between 5 p.m. and 11 p.m. And then the Ahwatukee Crime Watch uh, group with Tracy Church, who is another amazing volunteer in our community. Uh, it's going to be next Saturday from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m., and that's at 3550 East Knox Road. And I'd uh, love to see people come out, come out and see your neighbors, come out and talk, and as a matter of fact, get to know your neighbors. It's a good thing. Uh, there are two of us in our neighborhood that since we do our, a lot of our own yard work. So we're always out in the front yard and we talk to each other. His name's Eric. The rest of them, they always have somebody doing something, right? And so Eric and I get a chance to talk quite a bit because we're always out in the front yard talking to each other and you get the chance to see what's happening in your own neighborhood. It's, it's amazing how much you learn and how many things you can get involved in. Matter of fact, we had a situation where one of my neighbors last year, he had uh, a water burst line and nobody else knew how to fix it. So of course they come over to my home because myself and Lori Crouch across the street from me are the only ones who know how to fix things. You know, Eric does too, but Lori and I are the ones that they always call on. And so we went down there and it was literally a flood was coming down the, the roadway. And so we ended up fixing the, the water line, taking care of that. And I think that's the kind of thing that people want to see in neighborhoods. It's, it's amazing once you get to know your neighbors. Thank you, Mayor. So are you on call for all of us? Yeah. <laughs> hey, I offered to come and mow your yard that one time. I know I you did, you and I appreciate it. Thank and, you. And trim your bushes over there. Thank you. Councilman Noah Kelsey, do you have anything today? Absolutely, Mayor. Thank you for the opportunity to share. Tonight's um, Fall into Fitness program, that's at Margaret Hands Park the, um, from about 7 o'clock. So everyone's invited to go out there and, and start getting fit during the fall time. Also, this coming Saturday, We'll be at the Cash Community. That's right off of um, between 35th Avenue and 43rd Avenue um, from Southern to Broadway that we're going to be out there cleaning that neighborhood up. So if you're up on a Saturday morning about 7 o'clock, we'll be out there cleaning up that whole mile radius. So come on down and, and help out. And if you happen to live in that area, we'd like you to come out and help clean up your neighborhood. Also, um, at University Park, we're going to be having a game event on... Um, October 25th, that's from eight to, that's from five to eight. So we invite everyone out that lives in the downtown area to come out to University Park. That's right there on 13th Avenue and Van Buren. Also, Mayor, we have October 27th, that's a Saturday, Noche de Blanco. If you've never been to that great fundraiser, everybody um, dresses up in white and, it's a, and the money goes to a great cause. And it's right here at Margaret Hands Park. Also on October 28th in South Phoenix at the um, South Plaza, right there on the corner of Central and Southern, we're gonna have a trunk or treat. Um, so basically you have all kinds of, um, some low riders out there and some community people that are trying to keep um, Halloween safe and, and for all those young people and really wanna thank all the vendors and the stores in South Plaza for donating the candy and helping out and, and giving back to the community. And last mayor is the October 29th at Desert West um, Community Center. We're going through a re, um, we're gonna do a reopening. They've been remodeling it for the last five weeks and people are wondering when it's gonna open up again and it looks beautiful, um, the staff's excited. So we're waiting that Monday, um, October 29th to have you come on out and look at the remodel of our center. And I just wanna thank you, Mayor, and my council members that went out to the GAIN event that we had, a, a big kickoff. Um, I call it Christown Mall, but Spectrum Mall. And um, it was, what a great turnout. I mean, all the different resources from the city of Phoenix out there and people that help out in their neighborhood block watches and neighborhood um, patrol, they were all out there and just basically sharing ideas and and really helping out and you know we just everybody's really appreciative of all the support that the council and the mayor does for the um, block watch um, community in our neighborhood so thank you all for showing up and helping out in the um, in the gain event out at the kickoff thanks thank you it's ironic my list says kickoff at Christown <laughs> <laughs> hard to have it to break councilwoman Pastor thank you mayor um, I would like to uh, let everybody know that I have, well, I'd like to thank Dr. Shukla and Dr. Pritchard uh, who approached me regarding uh, cancer with our public safety. 
and uh, they approached me on uh, the different types of cancers. There are nine different types of cancer screening that are available to our public safety. And so uh, tomorrow with Vincere Cancer Center, um, I am partnering up with uh, public safety uh, from Glendale, Peoria, Scottsdale, and Paradise Valley to kick cancer. Um, they will be, it's screening and early prevention. Um, and so we will be uh, using advanced technology into uh, looking at uh, the diff in helping cure cancer. And so uh, we're really out to wipe out cancer amongst our public safety in the state of Arizona. It's a unique partnership uh, because we're also partnering with Deepak Chopra and that effort and the importance of that is to be treating the mind and spirit in addition to the body as they uh, move through the process of cancer. And so it's a, I wanna thank all the medical partners that are doing this with me. Um, October 17th uh, at eight o'clock, I will be hosting uh, a coffee chat with Laura in the community. It's at Dusa's Kitchen in the historic Coronado neighborhood. And so come out and have some good fun food, fun, and conversation. We really enjoy ourselves. And I'm not sure if any of my other colleagues mentioned this, but uh, once again, Phoenix has risen to the occasion and scored perfectly on the Human Rights Campaign Municipality uh, Equality Index. And I'm very proud of that since I uh, uh, was uh, a co-chair on 9090. I am still the chair, but I also had a partner at that time. and. Uh, the fact that our city is uh, consistent for non-discriminatory laws and practices and offering equal benefits and protections to all uh, our employees and ensuring that all residents are included in the city services and program programs evident to HRC. So I'd like, uh, like to thank my colleagues in achieving this goal. And that is all for today. Thank you. Councilwoman Starr. Yes, thank you. I, I too wanted to thank Chris Town. See, we all call it Chris Town still, for hosting the uh, wonderful game kickoff event. I also want to give kudos to Jeff Desault, who is actually the security at Chris Town, but is also the head of the East Sunny Soap Block Watch. Very active, does a lot of good things for Sunny Soap as well as our Block Watch programs. Um, and also, I'm really excited about October 20th because that is our um, annual gain event. I have so many neighborhoods, there's too many to list, but I'm really excited. I can't wait for the event. Thank you. Councilwoman Mendoza. As we all know, October is Domestic Violence Month, and District 8 has two bins out in the community collecting hygiene uh, uh, items for um, victims of domestic violence that's going to be shared throughout some of the shelters. And we have one at, um, at uh, Cesar Chavez Library, and another one at First New Life Missionary uh, Baptist Church in 1902 West Rosier. So if anyone's watching and would like to donate some items, you can drop them off at Cesar Chavez Library or at First New Life Missionary Baptist Church, or you can call my office and I can go and pick them up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm excited to announce that Condor Airlines is increasing nonstop service between Sky Harbor and Frankfurt, Germany from two days a week to three days, Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday, and it'll be from May through October of 19. And JetBlue is adding new service between Sky Harbor and Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Daily nonstop begins February 2019. I had the privilege of working with the Red Cross and the firefighters and attended the smoke alarm walk where the fire alarms were installed uh, in homes. We went door to door, knocking and see if we could go in and actually install a new fire alarm. Um, the reception was very good. The fire alarms were provided free uh, to the effort and uh, I really applaud them for doing this. We said gain event at Christown, so I'll make it the third time. <laughs> it was well attended, and I wanted to thank Jeff and, and the mall. Um, it was really, really organized well, and great attendance, and thank all those block watches that come out and participated. 
I also had the privilege of attending the Arizona Forward Environmental Excellent Awards. I want to congratulate the Crescordia Awards winner, which was Parks and Rec Department, City of Phoenix, South Mountain Park and Preserve Master Plan. The plan identified 51 miles of existing designated trails to be protected or improved and adopts 38 miles of existing non-designated trails into the trail system. Great job and we're really, really proud of them. We had other departments that received award of distinction, public works for the Risen Incubator Program, the partnership between the City of Phoenix and ASU, Parks and Rec, South Mountain Park and Preserve Big Ramada. The Ramada, I was so impressed, it's 80 years old and they, uh, it's a historic building now and they were able to uh, restore it into fine condition so it's sitting there in the pristine desert. You could sit and enjoy the desert, the environment, and it's a beautiful setting. And uh, I had a constituent contact me telling me about the minority women who are suffering uh, with babies born with very low birth weight and have a much higher fatality rate. And so I asked the Women's Commission to take this on as a project and they are willing to do so. So I'm looking forward to their research and activities in the future. And I believe that's all we have for today for follow-up request. I believe the next is a consent motion. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, in accordance with a properly posted notice and agenda, I move that the City Council pursuant to Arizona Revised Statute Section 38-431.02a meet in executive session on Tuesday, October 23rd, 2018 at 1 p.m. in the East Conference Room, 12th floor of the Phoenix City Hall, 200 West Washington Street, Phoenix, Arizona. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, next is reports and budget by City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. We had a successful uh, meeting last week with the council. Thank you for the direction from the council. And just to let you know, city staff yesterday, Monday, October 8th, kicked off their three plus nine review process, which is the beginning of our budget process. And so that is underway and we'll be back uh, in early 2019 with the council to begin the public process as well. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Um, that brings us to item one water resources, infrastructure, and financial plans. Would staff like to come forward? I'm trying to name. <laughs> Everybody in the right place? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor, members of the council. I'm very pleased to be here today at this uh, this regular policy session and to introduce this item. Uh, with me today is uh, Water Services Director Katherine Sorensen, Assistant Water Services Director Troy Hayes, and of course our Chief Financial, Financial Officer Denise Olson. I'm gonna turn it over to them for the presentation. Uh, Mayor, City Council, thank you so much for allowing us to talk with you today about this important subject. Um, on our presentation. So we're uh, here today to ask for your approval of a notice of intent for a water rate increase of 6% in 2019 and an additional 6% in 2020, um, as recommended by our Citizens Water Rate Advisory Committee. Um, I want to emphasize that this is not a vote today to increase rates. It's really a vote about allowing us to go forward with a public process and hear what our citizens have to say. And really, this is uh, a story about investing in our future and rebuilding our core. So the challenge before us is, is really quite clear. Um, one thing you understand living in the desert is the value of water. Um, water is the foundation of public health, econom economic opportunity, and quality of life in our desert city. Phoenix must ensure reliable water deliveries for all of our customers, 24-7, 365 at the tap. And of course, continued economic investment in our desert city hinges on our ability to provide certainty in those water deliveries. 
Desert cities are, of course, the oldest cities, but to stand the test of time, Phoenix must manage its water supply sustainably. And of course, uh, we have risen to the challenge. Um, we have really been pioneers in wise water management. As you guys know, we have built a portfolio that is both legally and physically diverse. We've been building that portfolio for decades. We've tied the ability to grow, to subdivide land, to an adequate water supply. Those laws are still among the most progressive in the country regarding land use and water availability. We've developed a, a culture of wise water use thanks to our customers who've embraced um, a, a message of conservation. Our water rate use has fallen 30% in the last 20 years. We've, as a community, we converted from the use of fossil groundwater supplies to the use of surface water supplies. That was a major investment, hundreds of millions of dollars. And it was made for the purpose of making sure that those fossil groundwater supplies are protected for the future and for times of drought. We've settled our water rights disputes with Native American communities, uh, the federal government, the state, irrigation districts, because if you're going to plan for your water supplies, you need certainty. And of course, the city of Phoenix has really been a pioneer in the reuse of reclaimed water. Um, we've been reclaiming our wastewater for 40 years and reusing it. Um, other cities across the arid west are only now just discovering the value of this resource that we've long known. And we're very proud of what we've accomplished, but my message to you today is that we really need to do more. We've inherited this incredible legacy, but now it's our turn to do what we need to do to make sure future generations have a reliable water supply as well. And of course, I'm sure you've been reading in the paper, the challenge before us is, um, is quite clear. The Colorado River itself is over allocated, and I want to put that in context for you. Um, the city of Phoenix uses about 300,000 acre feet of water every year. The Colorado River is over allocated to the tune of 1.2 million acre feet of water every year. We're in year 18 of drought. We hope it's year 18 of an 18 year drought, but we have to plan as though it is year 18 of a 100 year drought. Lake Mead water levels are dropping. Um, and let me go through that a little bit. Um, and that's as a result of over allocation and because of um, our current drought conditions on the Colorado River. The Secretary of the Interior um, who's the water master of the Colorado River, he declares a shortage when Lake Mead elevations fall to 1075. That's a tier one shortage. A tier two shortage is declared at Lake Mead elevations 1050, and a tier three shortage is declared at Lake Mead elevations 1025. Arizona loses uh, access to more and more Colorado River water as Lake Mead levels decline. Uh, to make matters worse, Scientists are telling us that the Colorado River Basin is aridifying. It's becoming more arid. And in fact, the most recent research indicates that we might expect that flows from the Colorado River will diminish by about 25 to 30 percent in the future. And this is bad news for us, of course, because 40 percent of our demands are met with Colorado River supplies. Uh, recently, the Bureau of Reclamation, which manages the Colorado River, uh, published projections that indicate that Lake Mead water levels uh, could fall and hit what's called Deadpool within four years. Below Deadpool, no water comes out of the dam. These are worst case projections, but if we see it, we need to plan for it. Um, because we are in the business of providing certainty in the delivery of water for public health and continued economic investment in our community. And I also want to be clear about something. I'm not worried about shortage. You guys know we've been planning for shortage for decades. We have built our portfolio because we knew that, we, that Central Arizona was last in line in priority on the Colorado River. But shortages are only defined to Lake Mead water elevations 1025. Below that level, there are no clear rules about who gets water under the law of the river. And Phoenix is vulnerable to extreme Colorado River shortages. By vulnerable, I mean that there are portions of our water distribution system 
where we would be able, where we would be unable to meet demands in extreme Colorado River shortage scenarios. Um, and that's not because we don't have enough water. We've built a strong portfolio. It's because we don't have the infrastructure to move water where it needs to go in areas that are currently dependent on Colorado River supplies. So not all of you will remember this, uh, but we talked about this four years ago. This is our black swan. And if you'll recall, uh, you were all really impressed when this black swan moved across the page. I think we've come a long way since then. I will tell you, this black swan came swooping in much faster than I ever expected she might. So uh, we need to get to work. Uh, our plan to address Colorado River issues is really based on three things, uh, conservation, infrastructure, and partnership. So first, uh, we really need to increase our ability to access groundwater and uh, Colorado River supplies that we've previously banked underground in our aquifers. Um, we will not pursue a single strategy in that regard. We'll have a basket of opportunities available to us on, for different circumstances. Um, over the last few years, we've been bringing forward to you different agreements um, that really enhance our ability to get access to this water. Um, the Phoenix-Tucson exchange was the first of this type of agreement. And if you'll recall, through the uh, Tucson exchange, we basically have a way to legally rely on banked water but leverage Tucson's well field to bring us uh, surface water supplies at our water treatment plants. We also need to be drilling our own wells. Um, so that in, particularly in portions of our service territory that are vulnerable to Colorado River shortages. We have 21 active wells in our service territory and we're looking at building uh, 15 additional wells in vulnerable areas. More recently, uh, this uh, council approved an agreement with the Salt River Project. This agreement um, basically gave us a first right of refusal to SRP's well pumping capacity. Um, SRP will pump its wells and recover Colorado River supplies that we have previously banked in the SRP service territory. SRP then pumps those wells and um, puts that water in the SRP canals. We can then pick up that water through the SRP canal at either our 24th Street or Deer Valley water treatment plants. Um, but the kicker is from there, we need to move that water north to areas of our distribution system that are normally dependent on Colorado River supplies. And that really takes us to, um, to our, uh, the other thing that we're doing in terms of infrastructure and Colorado River supplies. Um, we're really focused on being able to move water where it needs to go in extreme shortages. Like I said, we have enough alternative supplies. What we lack is the infrastructure to get that water where it needs to go. Um, our distribution system was really built to be dependent on surface water supplies. And when we're talking about needing to recover a bunch of banked water that's underground, um, we need to enhance our ability to move that water where it needs to go. To do that, we'll need to build additional transmission mains, pump stations, and pressure reducing valves. All told, the city of Phoenix can expect to expend something on the order of $500 million in the next five years um, on infrastructure and resiliency projects related to Colorado River shortages. I, and I know this is a, a big price tag. Um, if it makes you feel any better, Las Vegas had to spend about $1.5 billion um, on infrastructure to prepare for shortages in Lake Mead. Um, but really fundamentally, we, we have a choice here. We can plan and we can invest in this infrastructure and we can provide certainty for investment and for public health, or we can continue to be dependent on snowpack. Um, so we're coming forward with solutions. We can provide water even in extreme shortages on the Colorado River, but we need to invest in this infrastructure. I also wanna say this is an immense undertaking. The transmission mains that we're talking about are approximately 48 inches in diameter, which is very large, and they run a combined, they will run a combined 12 miles uh, through the city of Phoenix. This is not infrastructure that you can stand up in six months. This takes years to build, and now is the time to invest. 
So Phoenix has um, a very long and um, we've, we've long practiced integrated water supply and demand planning and conservation has always been the bedrock of our water resources planning. Um, like I said, our water consumption rates have fallen 30% in the last 20 years. We basically serve the same amount of water today as we did 20 years ago, but we're serving 400,000 more people with that same water. Um, were it not for these gains in water efficiency, we would already outstrip all of our available Colorado River supplies. Um, this, uh, the Phoenix City Council, this body just recently approved um, our enhanced conservation efforts and we're just very grateful for your support. One of the best ways that the Water Services Department can show its commitment to conservation is how we react to leaks and breaks throughout the system. And so we've made some changes with the leak and break crews as well as bringing on some contract crews that will deal with some of the smaller service lines that we have while our crews are looking at the larger mains. And what we've been able to achieve over the past few years is almost an 80% reduction in the average time that it takes us to respond to leaks and breaks. So um, the, third, uh, the third leg of our stool is partnership. Um, we work together as a region to address water supply issues. Um, we always have and that we will continue to work collaboratively going forward in the future. This is just kind of a smattering of some of the groups that we've been working with over the last several years. Um, these partnerships matter. We can obviously accomplish much more working together than if we go it on our own. Um, to recap, I just want to say that I, I am confident that we can provide certainty in the delivery of safe, clean water, even in the face of very extreme Colorado River shortages, but we need to invest in the infrastructure now. The second phase of the infrastructure plan that we have is rebuilding our core or reinvesting in the infrastructure that we currently have in the ground. What we have here is a, a picture of the 1920s uh, Verde transmission main. This is the main that would bring Verde River water into Phoenix um, in the 1920s and 30s. And it was a, future, a past generation that reinvested and replaced this infrastructure with the infrastructure that we're using today, the water treatment plants, the pump stations, and the pipelines that we have running up and down the streets. And so it's that commitment that we have to make sure that we have a reliable infrastructure that currently we have in the ground as well as for the future generations to rely upon. The City of Phoenix has one of the largest transmission uh, distribution systems in the United States. We have over 7,000 miles of pipeline, 430,000 service lines, and the service lines are the little three-quarter inch, one-inch pipelines that go from the mains in the street to the houses and businesses. And just to put into perspective the 7,000 miles of pipeline, that is the same miles of pipeline that, that uh, Los Angeles has and twice as much pipeline as the City of Chicago has, even though they're surging, serving larger uh, populations. Our distribution system is vast. It's spread out all throughout our 540,000 square miles of service territory. And, and as this infrastructure ages, it's vulnerable to leaks and breaks. This was a bad day. I think a lot of us remember. Um, this was a 54-inch pipeline that split over at uh, 35th Avenue and Van Buren. Um, I think we should get some residuals from the law firm there or something as much as we're showing this picture. But it's this type of, of investment that we need to get back that we need to make sure that we can reduce or eliminate these kind of failures that we have in the future. And to that end, in, in the five-year capital plan that, that we're proposing is we're going to be tripling the investment in pipelines. Um, just to put it in perspective, uh, the pipeline section is the largest section of infrastructure that we have. It's, it's, it's about the same size as the infrastructure that Catherine talked about earlier that we're talking about with drought. What we're going to be investing in pipelines um, in the next five years, it's about that same magnitude. And, and some may think, you know, the, the water services, uh, the city of Phoenix is a young city, but in fact, the water services department is over 110 years old. And we have infrastructure, you know, built in the 50s and 60s and 70s that needs that replacement. We have pipelines built in the 30s and 40s that need to get replaced. And that's really what this component of the infrastructure program is based on. Our, the, the infrastructure that we build, as Catherine discussed, is very complex and, and, and large. This is the 
the Deer Valley Water Treatment Plant's reservoir that was replaced. The original reservoir was built in the 1960s. And as you can see, it's a int intricate uh, steel and concrete and all that to reestablish this reservoir. This picture is the Val Vista transmission main. Um, what they're doing is they're flying in a new segment of pipe and what they're gonna be doing is installing this pipe into that other pipe. And so we're using different types of uh, construction technologies and things like that in order to speed up and have less impact as we go throughout the city. Uh, this is a, a vital component of our infrastructure that needs to be replaced. And, and like I said earlier, it's really our responsibility to ensure that we have reliable infrastructure now and that's built for future generations to come. So I'm going to bring this home and talk about what all of this means in terms of the utilities finances. So if you, if you look at it in total, um, the water utility needs to cover approximately $3.4 billion in costs over the next five years. And this $3.4 billion is the basis of our five-year financial plan and our rate recommendation. You'll notice um, the largest piece of that, the light orange, is in capital. Our capital needs are really what drive our need to increase rates. In light orange, you have what we intend to build or rehabilitate or replace. And in dark orange, debt service, you see that's what we pay for infrastructure that we have already built. Between those two pieces, you're talking about more than 60% of the cost of the utility. That makes us unlike some of the other city departments um, in which personnel is really the driving cost. For us, it's infrastructure. Um, that, I wanna break down, because it's so important, I wanna break down this capital piece for you. It's approximately $1.5 billion over the next five years. Um, and if you look at it more closely, What we're talking about spending is $525 million on rehabilitation and replacement of aging pipelines. Um, another, as I mentioned, another $500 million um, in Colorado River infrastructure that we need to withstand shortage. And those are really the two biggies. So of, of the $1.5 billion, the bulk of it is in those two items. We intend to spend um, about $185 million on our water treatment plants, our pump stations, about $140 million, and then other items. Um, this would include like power redundancy, uh, software upgrades, security, those kinds of things, about $100 million. And then our water storage tanks and reservoirs, another $50 million. So we have a really fantastic Citizens Water Rate Advisory Committee that spent uh, many dozens of hours poring over um, our capital needs, our operational needs, our efficiencies, our financial plans, our budgets, our benchmarks, our water resource plans, hour after hour of technical presentations. And I couldn't be more grateful for their time and, and effort. I know we ask a lot of them. And knowing that affordability is really a rising issue in the industry, this, uh, the Citizens Water Rate Advisory Committee actually formed a subcommittee to specifically study affordability in our industry and in the city of Phoenix in particular. They spent close to a year and a half on this effort. Um, and what they found at the end of the day is that the city of Phoenix actually has very affordable water rates, particularly compared to other major cities across the country. Um, this is largely due to our rate structure. The city of Phoenix has very low fixed charges, about $5.50 uh, for single family homes, for most single family homes. And within that $5.50 comes an allowance of water. Um, and if you basically, if you stay within that allowance of water, uh, and that allowance of water is, it's enough for your basic indoor needs. If you stay within that allowance, you're paying on the order of $8 a month for your water. This makes us very affordable when you benchmark us across other utilities. So this slide just shows you, oh, I'm sorry, uh, I should mention, uh, the Citizens Water Rate Advisory Committee did unanimously recommend um, a 6% rate increase uh, that would become effective in February of 2019, and an additional 6% rate increase that would become effective in February of 2020. Uh, this chart just shows you the history of water rate uh, adjustments over the last several years. 
Um, you can see that annual water rate adjustments were the norm for some period of time. Um, and in fact, you have to go back uh, previous to this to 1993 to find a year in which we did not adjust water rates. Um, more recently, we went for three years without a water rate increase, and then the Phoenix City Council approved a 3% increase in 2016 and a 2% increase in 2017. Uh, there was no rate increase in 2018. Uh, so, of course, um, the vote today, like I said, is not about asking for a rate increase. It's really about uh, hearing from the public. If the council approves this notice of intent, uh, we will conduct very extensive outreach with the public um, all throughout October and November. Um, I will tell you, we're going to show up anywhere someone is willing to let us talk to them. Um, the other thing is we, we know where everyone lives because we deliver your water. So we will be mailing uh, a notice to every single account holder in the system so that we are fully transparent and people understand um, exactly what the recommendation is, what the timeline is, and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, we will bring the results of this outreach back to the Phoenix City Council and ask for a vote on the rate recommendation on December 12th. If that vote is successful, then uh, water rates would become, new water rates would become effective in February of 2019. So again, we're, we're here to ask for your approval of the notice of intent uh, to increase water rates by 6% in 2019 and an additional 6% in 2020. Um, this would allow us to kick off the, the public process and uh, allow us to go out and hear from citizens. So like I said, water is the foundation of public health and economic opportunity in our desert city. Um, this is about rebuilding our core and investing in our future. Um, we're here because of a legacy of wise water management, and we're asking you today to help us continue that legacy. And with that, I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Councilman Stark. Uh, yes, thanks. And the slide that you show the average repair time for the water main leaks and breaks going down 79%. Mm -hmm. How much better would it be if we do reconstruct most of our water lines? Would we just see minimal complaints? I get a lot of complaints on water leaks, yeah. as you know, and so I wonder how would that affect if we do this massive infrastructure right. upgrade? So, we, so uh, we do expect it to improve, and um, I, I have some numbers on what we can expect. It might take me a minute to dig that out. But let me, but let me tell you, the other thing that we're, so we get between four and 6,000 leaks a year in our system, but three quarters of those are on service lines. And like Troy said, those are the lines that run from the, me, from the main to the customer's uh, address. And what we're also looking at doing is implementing a program where we are going through neighborhoods with plastic service lines and wholesale replacing them. And we expect that will be one of the big drivers for our customers. Right, so right now we have a program that's currently going through as built and trying to identify where the plastic service lines are because that is the majority of what we're seeing for leaks and breaks is those small three quarter inch, one inch lines. And so as we identify those areas, um, there's some up in your district, we have some out in Maryville, um, that we're gonna go back in and wholesaling and, and, and replacing those service lines in the whole neighborhood. So therefore reducing the amount of leaks or breaks that they are more than likely that are gonna happen because it's those types of pipes that are breaking far before, faster than the mains themselves. So if you do that, that would be a part of this program? It is, it okay. is a part of this program, yes. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, I have cards. Uh, Councilman DeCicchio? Well, mine's more along the comment side, and see if I can get staff also to pair something for me. I just did a back of the napkin look at where we were in 2000, just did it just now, to today. So if you're paying $100 in 2000, you're paying $246 today. So I'd like, again, I'd rather have you guys prepare the documentation on that. So let's say water rates were $100, that was your bill in 2000, and your wastewater rate was $100 what would we be paying today the way it is now and then where would it be with the increase because you got to take a look it's a compounded number you know I drilled that into my staff today too I said it's not just a three percent increase it's three percent upon whatever that base amount is upon another uh, percentage on that they get it they're actually really good at math I've got Millennials in my office that know how to do math it's a good thing <laughs> it's rare but it's a good thing um, the other is I want to talk if I could too um, 
the way you handled yourself, Catherine, is exemplary. I mean, your entire team, when it came to these negotiations and discussions with these other groups, I get reports on a pretty regular basis, as you could probably guess, because I know the groups that are there. Every one of them talks about how hard you've been in the meetings and tough you've been in, I shouldn't say hard, tough you've been in the meetings and been really been protective of our water. I think it's critical that it is. And I also know that there's some large industry groups that have been doing pushback. The way I describe some of those groups, I get it. I mean, they've got a certain level of power here in the state. And they are, and they're good people. There's nothing wrong with it. But they're one-offs. They're only looking at their own situation, not looking as a whole. When it comes to water, we have to look at things holistically throughout the entire state. If you go back into the early days of Arizona, water has always been our crucial lifeblood. I mean, this is it. If we don't have water, we've been lucky. We've had uh, people from Hayden, John Rhodes, Barry Goldwater, others, John Kyle to the most recent, who have made water their number one priority. And that has been crossing political lines. It's just been Republican or Democrat. De Dennis DeConcini, amazing when it came to water policy too. So from my end of it, I mean, I think that's important. Uh, but the other part of it deals with the affordability side of it. We've talked about this before. In particular, those poorer areas, we're starting to see high heat islands, significant heat islands, because they're taking their water out. I mean, they're taking plants out, they're taking grass out. So what's happening in those areas and there is a disparity occurring. I mean, if you look, in, especially in some of the downtown areas, you're going to see, because people can't afford to pay their water bill, and that does happen. Okay, whenever you see a jacking up of rates, there are gonna be individuals that cannot afford it. When we did, to give you an example, when we did the um, after-school program that Phil Gordon and I started back in the 90s, actually, we had a rate increase of, I think, of $30 a month for some families, and that was so significant. We saw a 62% drop-off of people being able to keep their kids there in after-school programs that were necessary. And that was just from a $30 a month increase. And for some people, they can afford that, others cannot. So the heat islands, I think, are gonna be significant. I'm not gonna ask you what you're gonna do about it here, because that's, you know, we got more things to talk about, too. But when you're dealing with these HOAs that are out there where they buy significant amounts of water, they're making decisions. We're starting to see golf courses go out. Now, people can always argue whether or not golf courses should be part of society or not. It doesn't matter. They are. And that has a dramatic impact on people's homes that bought around there. Because if those, land, uh, if those properties go dark and they start decreasing in value, it impacts all of us. Whether we agree with the golf course or not, it's still an open space. Our parks have a need for water. So all of it has a compounding effect throughout our entire society, whether or not we agree with it or not, the function, it doesn't matter. The fact of the matter, it's there. Any, anything that you take away from that has a negative impact. So, I mean, it goes from HOA, small business owners have really complained about their water, uh, and in particular neighbors, you know, homeowners. And so this is a dramatic increase here. So I, I'm, I'm still not sold that we need that kind of increase. I'm still not there. But um, I get what you're trying to accomplish and the fact that you've done it at a uh, macro level, too, with these other organizations, Catherine, I think is incredibly impressive. I mean, I'm not just telling you that to tell you that. I mean, I, I follow what you do, believe it or not. And I do follow what your team has been doing. And it's been very impressive the way you defended the city of Phoenix. I've just got to tell you that. I think you're getting close to an agreement, or have you reached an agreement with the other groups? Uh, don't let the small, in, not small, these large industry groups push you around on that. Uh, there's a bigger, I'm just letting you know, without getting into too many details, um, we do support you. I mean, at least I do. I'm sure the rest of the council would too. Um, but the direction you're heading in those negotiations and discussions, um, I think it's called DCP, you know, um, I think is to the city of Phoenix's benefit by far. So keep doing what you're doing. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you. Other questions? I do. Councilwoman? Thank you. I want to go back to what Councilman DeCicia was talking about. Can you explain the difference between a commercial customer versus a single family customer and how the rate will affect each? Uh, Mayor, Councilwoman Mendoza, sure. So um, we, here in the city of Phoenix, we charge the same amount per unit of water um, no matter who you are. So we do not have customer classes. So we do not charge a different rate for single family, multifamily, or commercial. Everybody pays the same amount 
per unit. Um, and that is unusual. A lot of places have customer classes, but here in the city of Phoenix, we made the policy choice that a unit of water is worth a unit of water no matter who is using it. Um, and so the impact is really, it's basically the same across those customer classes. It just depends on how much you use and when you use it. Our rates are seasonal. Uh, that means that we charge more for water in the summer and less for water in the winter. So really, the impact to each family, small business, uh, large commercial industry will depend really on their particular water use pattern. I, I believe uh, just today we got our new uh, water rate calculator online. Um, mm -hmm. it, and we designed this specifically for this process because we want people to understand exactly what the impact will be to their bills. You can go online to our website. We have a calculator where you can, you can type in your consumption month by month and it'll kick out for you exactly what the impact of this will be. That being said, let me say a couple of things. Our average customer uses close to 14 CCF uh, per month in a, in a given year. That's about 10,400 gallons per month. If you look like that, if you're kind of our average customer, uh, whether you're single family, multifamily, or small business, or what have you, you can expect that the 6% rate increase um, in 2019 will cost you about $2.35 a month, and that the additional 6% then in 2020 would cost you about $2.29 a month. So when it's all said and done, when the, if the rates are fully implemented, um, it's just south of $5 a month as an impact to your bill. If you are someone who is very conscientious and you conserve and um, you use less uh, than our average customer, you can expect that impact to be about a dollar a month um, in 2019 and about 75 cents in 2020. If, you're more, if, you, if your consumption looks more like one of our large users, you have a lot of grass, a lot of lush landscaping, um, you can expect that it will be uh, about $5 a month. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have the number right in front of me, but about $5 a month uh, in 2019, about $5 a month in 2020. Okay, thank you. So a commercial property wouldn't pay any more than a single use? No, uh, Mayor, Councilman Mendoza, it just, it really depends on their individual Water consumption usage. pattern. Mm -hmm. Okay. Exactly. Thank you. And just to clarify, it's phoenix.gov slash water would be the website where people can find all the tools uh, for their, for their information. Seeing no one else, I'll go to the cards. Lennon Clark. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members, for letting me speak. I just want to say three words, global climate change. Now, thank you, because in the legislature at this point, they would tell me, what you're saying, Mr. Clark, is not germane, because that's what they do there. It is very germane that I bring up global climate change right now. As you know, the United Nations report just came out about what's going on, and I know, and in deference to some of my conservative friends who don't believe in it, I, once again, I've said this at the meeting before, better safe than sorry, when in doubt, salute, as I found out the hard way in the Army, you know, you know, so we cannot take a chance anymore. So what I'm concerned about is I put down neutral, you know, for a future, uh, you know, increase. Uh, what I would like to see just is how much, and I know you're putting these numbers down, but I want to see, make sure that we're guaranteeing that the core is being re rebuilt, but what I'm worried about is you know, um, is we're continuing to expand the city of Phoenix, and I, and I know nobody wants to talk about that, but I'm worried that developers want the northern part of Phoenix to continue developing. I live out in the north, and I see all of that area that hasn't been sold yet to the developers, so I'm highly concerned. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm worried that we're not even acknowledging global climate change. This is really about expanding more homes and I wish I could tell you the exact answer. I'm not here to be the, the downer at the party. I'm not gonna be, you know, the, I'm not, I want the city of Phoenix to be, rather than the Titanic heading for an iceberg, you know, and I'm here like, come on, you guys, look, there's an iceberg coming. I want you guys to acknowledge that we should do more things to act ahead of time instead of what it seems to be here is just reacting. I want us to be the love boat, not the Titanic. Can we have that? Let's make city of Phoenix the love boat, not the Titanic, and let's, Let's uh, 
start considering the fact that our young people are going to have to be on this earth long after I'm gone, you know, and we are really in big trouble. Phoenix is ground zero for global climate change. Again, my conservative friends, I know you're going to disagree with me, but why not just be safe and make some insurance? So I cannot go for this if this is just to help developers to expand the city of Phoenix. This is ignoring global climate change. Thank you, Leonard. Thank you so much. Oh, and Mayor, some uh, of I, us that, oh, Mayor, may I just I, respond back? So, Leonard, you can come back up here Catherine if you want. would like to respond. What's that? Catherine would like to uh, respond. Oh, Please. well, some of us actually do read those reports. Just came out uh, from the UN. It said we have 12 years until ca catastrophe hits. And it talks about a Celsius of one and a half percent is what is attainable, even though we're on a path of two and a half percent. So some of us actually read those reports. Thank you, and Trump himself, his people, seven degree runaway temperatures. He says we can do nothing. We can do something. You're our leaders. Thank you so much. Thank what you. an honor Catherine, to you. Catherine, would you uh, like to explain yeah, that? Sure, Mayor, thank you. Yeah, I, I should clarify one thing, because it is really important. I, I really should have mentioned it in the presentation as well. This, what we're proposing today, um, and the five-year financial plan that we've presented to you today is not about growth. Here in the city of Phoenix, growth pays for growth. We require um, people who build new subdivisions and new developments to put in their own infrastructure and to pay impact fees that pay for the regional infrastructure. This is not about growth. The $1.5 billion um, infrastructure plan does not include infrastructure for growth. This is really about making sure that what we have today, the supplies we have today, that serve the customers we have here today, are resilient. Thank you. Gilbert Arvizio. Thank you, Mayor Williams. Um, just uh, before I begin, the card behind mine is my dad, and he's donating his time to me. Um, but uh, Ms. Sorensen had mentioned uh, that there are uh, many opportunities in a little uh, uh, bag, if you will. So I would like to suggest another opportunity, and that is uh, the Rio Salado. Uh, I had an amazing opportunity last year as a full-time intern under Senator McCain to work on his Rio Salado project. I did a lot of research on it. Um, I briefed him once in Washington, D.C., and once here in Phoenix on the project. And, um, and so how would putting water in the Rio Salado help with our water strategy. Well, what you do when you put water in the Rio Salado is you start to recharge those aquifers, which are now dry. Um, they've been dry for many years now. And so, as we all know, we have innovative ways of storing water. So we would just continue to build on those uh, innovative ways. It would also fall in line with uh, this council's direction at restoring that Rio Salado habitat. Um, you know, we have the birds and the plants and all that, and that's nice now, but we don't have a flowing river or water in the river. Uh, in terms of public health, uh, ADEQ, when we met with them, they were ecstatic that we were considering putting water in a 45 mile dry riverbed because uh, the second leading contributor to pollution in our city is dust, and I'm sure a 45-mile dry riverbed contributes to that. Um, there's also another benefit, which is the economic benefit. Uh, we don't have to look far to see the economic benefits. Uh, Tempe Town Lake, uh, that was a $1.5 billion economic um, impact on the city. Uh, it's the second most visited um, area other than uh, the Grand Canyon. Um, uh, so you're probably asking, okay, well, where are we going to get the capital for this and the water? And I'll start with the easier of the two, which is the capital. Um, the uh, Rio Salado sits in what's called an opportunity zone. This didn't exist last year when I did research for Senator McCain. Uh, oppor qualified opportunity zones uh, incentivize investment in low-income communities by providing tax deferrals on short-term and long-term capital gains. Uh, essentially, this is a tool that uh, the private sector can use um, to invest in uh, these types of areas. And so what that does is that brings community and economic development throughout South Phoenix. And as we all know, that would mean increased uh, tax revenue 
Uh, I know we uh, are kind of hurting for some money here with public safety, streets, and many other things. So that could be uh, one way to bring in this uh, private sector uh, investment. And so uh, my point of all this is as we start to look at our water strategy and opportunities that we start to put our thinking caps on and start thinking about how we can use existing infrastructure, existing innovative strategies to conserve water and to move us forward into the next generation. Thank you. Thank you. Richard Ray. Mayor, City Council, for about nine years I've been involved in looking at either the water department and or uh, water services and also watching closely with what's going on in the water in the entire western half of the United States. It's been fascinating to see and it's amazing what we've gone through. Uh, the, the old joke about what whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting has been a very, very dominant thing for a long time, and it's something that this council and everybody else in similar positions has got to constantly be looking at. What we're doing here and what we, I'm on the committee, what we recommended was something that would take what we presently have, our existing infrastructure, and lay it over the top of a well-organized and well-run water department that is organized correctly, doesn't have waste, as, and we looked at that back in the Innovation Efficiency Task Force, in looking at what they're trying to do. The affordability numbers uh, that Chairman, uh, Councilman DeCicio was talking about actually are a little bit less frightening for people if you really start to look at it. The, uh, golf courses use a lot of water and they pay a lot of water and it would affect them to a degree. But what we're trying to do is show that this is a methodology to move Phoenix forward to make sure that those that are here now will have access to the water that's, that they need, will have access to ways to find additional sources and transport that around through the city and through the area to ensure that it, we're not all sitting here in 15 or 20 years wondering what the heck happened and why are we in South Africa or something like that. That's what we're trying to avoid and we've made good progress. Catherine has done a phenomenal job of getting us positioned correctly. Now it's a matter of just moving forward. So thank you. Thank you. Claude Mannix. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I really don't have a lot to add. Normally I do, but I think that uh, Catherine did an excellent job on her presentation laid it out very nicely. I think Richard did a great job of explaining what the committee has done. Um, I, I will add that the amount of time that we put in on this was no small amount of time. We've been working on this for over a year. We have had six committee of the whole meetings. We've had numerous subcommittee meetings. Uh, and ultimately, we came to support the recommendation, and today we're here to ask that you support the, in, the intent of notice so that we can move it forward and, and put it out to the public, as you, Councilman, had mentioned. It's important to get it out there and let people speak to it and hear and understand what exactly is going on. The only thing I'll, I'll, I will add to this, as, as Catherine had said, and I think, Mayor, uh, Councilman, you had alluded to, um, this is a not about growth. It's about economic stability, though. It is about us being able to continue to attract economic development. And for those, some of those businesses that are pushing back, I just call, what, 12 years ago, when there were moratoriums on putting meters in in Denver and moratoriums on putting meters in in Southern California and cities in Southern California paying, and in, in Nevada, if I remember correctly, paying to tear out yards grass yards and green yards, which contributes to the heat island effect because there was a shortage of water. And so what we're trying to prevent is putting ourselves in that position. We're just saying let's be able to meet the needs of our community, the needs of our businesses, and make sure that the economic stability of our community is there. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, Wesley, did you want to wait or do you want to speak now? Come on up. He's another important member of the committee that I appreciate this entire committee's hard work and efforts. Madam uh, Mayor, City Council members, <clears throat> I've been scrutinizing the water department since my colleague mentioned nine years, uh, specifically in rates. Uh, we took the water department apart, board by board, brick by brick, put it back together, and came up with a, a whole bunch of savings. As a result, what we don't laud enough is the fact that the city of Phoenix has the lowest water rates of any major city in the United States, has the lowest rates of, the city in, of any city within the state of Arizona, and, that, and we're talking about little cities. So we should be proud of where we're at, and we should be proud of the water department as we have it today, because it's a very far-reaching and forward-thinking group of people who have nothing but the benefit of the citizens at heart. And without water, we're, we're dead, literally and figuratively. So uh, I worked with the councilman of these the CCO on this particular thing way back in 2009. And it has been a passion, and we've studied it greatly. We would not come to you with this increase because I've resisted rate increases. It's the reason I got up here and I was loggerheads with my colleague, Mr. Ray, over, this, over the water increases. It is something that I'm very sensitive to. I'm also a financial executive. I know what it means to invest. You have to invest if you plan to reap, or we'll have the whirlwind to reap, and we cannot afford that, because that'll be the death of our city. We must have this, this increase. I definitely support it. I think that uh, Catherine Sorensen is probably the greatest manager you have in the city, present company excluded, of course, and uh, she's just doing a dynamite job and keeps us all abreast of it, and we've worked very hard on this particular issue. So we go forward from here, and we will build a great city and keep it running as we have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, seeing no more questions, we'll go, oh, pardon me, go ahead. I have questions. Are you Ask your questions, please. Okay. So when I first entered office, 2014 uh, I was that year I entered and there were a number of things in a whirlwind that happened and uh, through my tenure of the of the years uh, it was increases in water rates um, also increase I just lost the other piece um, increases and my first question to Catherine was if I'm going to vote for this, I'm only going to vote this way really one time in my career about an increase in uh, rates. And at that time, I said, can you estimate or can you look at what really the rate should be in order for us to settle where we need to settle for infrastructure and everywhere else. And at that time, I was told, oh, um, 2.6 and 2.0 is, is where we need it. So now I'm here today, <laughs> and uh, now we're doing 6.0 in 2019 and 6.0 in 2020. Now, I often hear, oh, it's only going to be $3 more, or it's only going to be $2 more. So. Uh, bear with me on my math, but in 2016, if I was paying $100 and I get a rate increase, it becomes 102.60. And then in 2017, it becomes, my bill becomes 104.65. Then in 2019, I was paying 104, you know, 104 in 2017, 2019 will become 110.88. And then 2020, it will become 116. Nope, uh, 118. So every year when there's a water rate or increase or any type of increase, 
Um, it's always like, oh, it's just another, it's, it's a $3 Starbucks, or it's a $3 Starbucks. Well, for communities, I believe in all our districts, uh, we have the working poor, it's what, the, what they call the working poor. And it is where these families have two or three jobs and really are living paycheck by paycheck, but they're still, they don't, benef they don't qualify for benefits, they're not necessarily in the middle class, but they're in the middle. So my question to you, Catherine, is who on your committee uh, from that area, from that background, or financial economic background, sat on the committee of the affordability study? Um, Mayor, Councilwoman Pastor, I, I'm sorry, I, I do not know the financial circumstances of those who sat on the committee, so I'm, I'm not able to answer that question. I can give you a list of the members who served on the subcommittee, but I, I don't know their specific economic condition. I can tell you that we looked um, very, very carefully and closely. Um, we worked, um, as you know, with um, people who are forefront in the field of affordability and bringing forward some really new ideas about how we can better measure affordability, particularly for those who are our most disadvantaged in our community. And our entire focus was on making sure that we are continuing to um, supply affordable water for that community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have, I, I have one for you. Did you want to speak? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I just saw you raise your hand. I'd like to speak to that issue, uh, Councilwoman. I chaired the subcommittee on affordability. It was from that vantage point that I made the comment that we have the lowest rates in the, in the country. We also have something that no, almost no other city has, and that is that uh, Catherine mentioned early in her presentation about the fact that the basic charge for your water bill, whether you use any or not, includes enough for a family of four to survive. You can't water your grass with it. You can't feed horses or, drink, or, or uh, water horses with it but you can water four people in your house. We're talking about minuscule amounts. I work with an organization down in South Phoenix between 20th and 21st Street, south of Southern. That is a low income area. Mm -hmm. I'm with those people all the time. We're working with at-risk kids all the time and I'm with families that are uh, in the area that you're talking about financially. We feed them, we give them food boxes every, every week. So I know what they're going through, but water, is number one. It's the first thing you, you have to pay for. You don't pay your rent, you don't pay anything else before you pay your water. And, and you can't afford it in any other city better than you could afford it in, this, in the city of Phoenix. Nobody hates any rate increases more than I do, or at least that's my opinion. Um, and I would never risk a low-income family uh, not being able to afford water. I would fight it with everything I have. This is very minuscule at that level. Thank you. Well, thank you for that, because you answered my question. Um, I want to go back to a slide that I want to point out. Um, as you know, I'm in the education world, mm -hmm. and I have been in many different um, training these days, and one of it is unconscious bias. And so I want to go back to a picture up here. Keep going. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to make this go as fast as I can. Oh, they were asking me, this one. Oh. So what I really like about this picture, well there's one woman of minority, but I, what I really like about this picture is there's diversity. Um, and so uh, I, as a trained in unconscious bias, <laughs> I continue to go through it, uh, is that it demonstrates diversity. I'm hoping that there, I see, I believe two women, but I'm hoping that in the future there are more women in there. Um, but I'm just telling, I'm just pointing it out because that's the eye I look at things now. I, I mean, I've been, but as a teacher. But um, I just think we need to be conscientious of, of our groups and our committees. So thank you. Anyone else? I, I, oh, oh, Councilman? Oh, thank you, Mayor. 
One, uh, Wes, I totally agree with you on the department staff. This is probably the best I've ever seen uh, at the city of Phoenix when it came to the water department. They do an incredible job over there. Otherwise, I wouldn't even be considering any of this stuff if it wasn't for that team that they've got over there. When it comes to water, one of the things that Richard Ray talked about, and if I could just follow up on a couple, and I know it's not going to be part of this, uh, he talked about South Africa and what's happening there with the water rationing, the whole thing. I think most of us know what's happening there. And one of the things that they're looking at is you know, their osmosis system or their desalinization plants. An idea came up multiple years ago in, by some of these groups that you're talking to about working together with other cities and either creating a desalinization plant in Mexico. They talked about California. I'm like, forget that. That'll never happen. Or even use the, what is it, $400 million plant that the federal government built down in Yuma. And, and that would allow us to keep our current system in place, not rely on the groundwater part of it, uh, because it's basically it would create another surface water where the water would be pumped up, go to Tucson, and then we would take the replacement from their CAP their cap water. Did anything ever come of that? I'm sure that's a, a big deal. It was a one and a half billion dollar price tag, but split amongst many cities, it becomes a lot less expensive. Uh, Mayor, Council Member DeCicio, so there is, um, there continues to be ongoing conversation about uh, desalination uh, in Arizona in partnership with Mexico, in partnership with California. Um, there's also uh, continued talk about desalination for uh, brackish groundwater uh, here more locally, which mm. might be more affordable, frankly. Um, but no, I, I, I think we know that Arizonans are very innovative when it comes to water. And uh, believe me, all solutions are on the table, and, and people are, are looking everywhere that they can for those new solutions for our community. But you're still talking about that idea. Mm -hmm. It was a couple years back. Mm -hmm. I kind of like the idea because I think it provides a long-term solution. It uses a lot of energy, but at the same time, it's a long-term solution. Um, we have a lot of water on the west side, too. A lot of wells are polluted. It'd be nice to clean those things up, too. Have you thought about how we can handle that? I'm sure you have. Uh, Mayor, Councilmember DeCicio, oh, a absolutely, and um, un unfortunately for us, um, there are not only um, unnatural contaminants here in our aquifers, but also natural ones as well. If mm -hmm. you'll recall, you know, we had uh, the story about chromium. Uh, nitrates can be naturally occurring as well as arsenic, but, but as long as it's not nuclear, we can clean it up, we can fix it, we can use it. And so, and we are always looking at those kinds of solutions. What matters to us is that the water is wet. There's a lot of technology out there. It's good technology. We can make sure that those supplies are, are clean and, and safe to drink, absolutely. And then just because the, I've heard it from the citizens too, I mean, it just made my mind think ahead too. We've created quite a few recharge basins throughout the valley. Are we looking at putting wells near them or are we just gonna keep those as recharge basins? Mayor, Council Member Sissio, one of the really great things about our partnership with um, the Salt River Project is that their wells are located exactly where we recharge our water. Mm. Uh, the other thing that we're doing is as we drill wells up in North Phoenix, um, we're, uh, we're, t we're designing them so that they can also recharge water uh, when we have water available to recharge. Basically, the well operates in reverse. Um, and then when we need to draw the water back out, we can. So we're always being very careful to um, recharge and pump it, you know, as close to each other as possible. Absolutely. And if I could, Mayor, just one last question, if I could, just as information. I'd like to get an idea of how much water we have available, some of those recharge basins, you know, where we started at. I think back there's even one off of Gilbert Road that we worked with the tribes with. Um, we've got quite a few. Uh, where we're at, what kind of capacity, that's something I haven't seen yet um, from anybody. What is our availability of groundwater? How much do we have? And then, not for now, because this is a longer look, I mean, once you start pulling water from the ground, you also start running into other problems, you know. Uh, and before we hit a peak or something like that, where, were we, where would we need to be when it comes to the availability of water that we already have here available? We used to be nothing but groundwater at one point. And I'm assuming that a lot of those areas have really recharged, you know, that we should have quite a bit of water underneath there. Um, the other is, I want to do follow up with what Councilwoman Pastore talked about, if we can use that $100 per month on water and wastewater and see where we would be today and then where would the impact would be. I think it's going to be quite a bit more than people think. And affordability, Wes, I know we may be lower than others, but affordability is really in the pocketbook of the payor. So, you know, if people can't afford it, they can't afford it, whether they're, 
you know, they're, they have the money or not. So, I mean, it's all relative. And when you look at those things, and that's pretty much it. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, our Vice Mayor. Well, I guess if I was just a layman listening to this and I had to sum up what I've heard you say, number one would be we have enough water in the city of Phoenix for a city of this size or bigger. The problem is transporting the water, which is what you're trying to address with this. Uh, the fact that we don't have enough water from the existing current source is an act of God or something beyond human control in terms of what we could do as a council, take, take the global discussion out of it. It's, it's not something that we could change in time to solve this problem as a city. That's just not, that's not realistic, obviously. So um, we can't fight the battles of the past. It, it is what it is. This is where we're at right now. It's not growth that's driving this problem. Um, generally speaking, people living somewhere don't use as much water as agriculture. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. So if we replace a farm with people, you might intuit, I would have before I was in this job, that that somehow adds to the problem, but that's actually not the case. Uh, you've talked about it before, we're using the same amount of water we used 20 years ago, but we've got 400,000 more people. That trend continues to either accelerate or at least keep going, right? We're getting more, more innovative doodads to save water. You stop me when I say something that's wrong no, keep or going. <laughs> bad. Um, $100 in 2000 is now $146.48. So you know, if you're adjusting for inflation, that's just you know, it's a 50% increase. Um, so just food for thought when you're factoring in uh, to the, the questions that were asked earlier by Sal. Um, you know, the bottom line is, I guess, we're trying to be efficient. This wasn't a self-made problem. And then for folks watching at home, they should not be concerned about the amount of water that we have. We have supplies, I think you said in the newspaper, generational supplies. It's just transporting the supplies. And, and um, for the city that can get the supplies, transporting it safely in pipes that aren't rotting or blowing up or what have you. Um, that's really what we're talking about here. Uh, to Wes's point, we have extremely low, if not the lowest, water rates. I mean, he said it, I didn't hear you say it, in Arizona, number one, he said, and then I think your chart said among major cities. Are both those things true? Um, Mayor, Vice Mayor, sorry. Uh, our water rates are very low. They are not the lowest in the country, nor are they the lowest in the state. But the, I can show you the benchmarks. We benchmark extremely well. Uh, okay, uh, and everybody gets treated the same with what they pay for the water. Correct. The businesses, people of means, people who have less means, businesses, they're all paying for the same, a unit of the product costs the same for everybody, which I, I do think is fair. I mean, I, it's hard to argue with that. I certainly understand the affordability argument, um, but of course, this is a product you can't live without either, so there is that. Um, and considering that it's a pretty low rate, I appreciate that that's the way it's been over the years. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Catherine, I just want to thank you and your staff. You have been on top of this. You will continue to fight the battle every day, it seems like. Uh, I am very supportive of this, very concerned for the North area. Uh, Colorado River, no one thought this could ever happen when it began. And so the system uh, did not go north. And now is the time we have to make sure that we have an infrastructure um, that you can feed from any of your plants, that it can be uh, fed so every house has water, every fire hydrant has water. And I, when it comes to the cost, you are very cost conscious all the time, whether it's the chemicals in the plants, redoing the plants, or replacing pipe. I know that it varies as years goes by, materials change, the costs change, uh, and it is probably a replacement plan. This won't end with this. It will always have a replacement into the future. 
It's just part of the system. Water corrodes things, and pipes break, and clay cracks eventually. Uh, so I think it's extremely important that we are on top of this. And I really commend you, because you have been right on spot, every detail. And I really appreciate all the presentations that you're doing out in the community. You make it easy to understand. Everyone knows how important water is. We take it for granted. We don't pay any attention. And I truly believe it's because you have provided such great service over the years. You go get in the morning, brush your teeth, have your coffee, uh, go on about your way, have your shower. Never once does anyone stop and think, oh, will there be water? Will it be safe? Because you've always done a great job. And we trust you, and I trust your judgment on what needs to be done, so I will be very supportive of going forward with this in the future. Thank you, Mayor. Which brings us to item two. This is where we need to make a motion of intent to consider an increase in the water rates and or rate components and set a public hearing date to consider the proposed increases. Mayor, I move that the City Council adopt a notice of intention to consider an increase in water rates and or rate components and set December 12, 2018 for a public hearing to consider the proposed increase. Second. Okay. Mayor, Good. just to clarify, that would be up 6% for each year, correct? Of 6%. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Each year. Thank you. Uh, Lieutenant Clark, did you want to? Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to correct you. Okay, thank you. Uh, conversation? Ready to vote? I'm ready to vote, but just a comment, Mayor. Go ahead. Mayor, I, I really want to thank the um, leadership of my colleagues when I first started about 11 years ago um, at the Sister Cities and at the League of Cities. Um, Claude Maddox and yourself have always represented the city on a national level when it comes to, to water issues and um, preventions and all that. One of the things that we don't really tell our story very well about all the savings that we've, we've done and my, the vice mayor explained it very well that you know, we're down 40% from 10 years ago or about 30 or so um, and we're increasing the population. So, I mean, it's incredible that we keep on growing and we're still spending, or we're still using as much water as we did 10 years ago. So that's just incredible. 20 years ago. 20 years ago, yeah. sorry about that. Yeah. Thank you for the correction Even better, yeah. Even better yeah. right? I but I think it's it's different. not just at the water departments throughout the whole city of Phoenix from our planning, zoning, being more conscious of, of what kind of yards to put out there, what kind of trees, and even in our parks, you know, we look at different types of, um, um, grass to put out there in our soccer fields and our parks and all that. So I think it's something that's been engraved in, in all of our minds. And once again, you know, um, Claude, I know that this was something dear to you and you worked very hard in educating all of us back then and yourself, Mayor. So I think it's paying off now. And what we're trying to do is making sure that in the future that we're prepared for it. And we're going to have that infrastructure to make sure that the water up north is being able to we can be able to pump the water up north and all that. So once again, and even our wastewater, we're actually selling our wastewater, and that was something that happened about six years ago or so, that we started to um, sell our wastewater up to the um, nuclear plant. And so it's just um, innovative ways of, um, of thinking, and, and I know that our water department has ran very well, and you guys continue to come up with those innovative ways and thinking outside of the box of how to save um, monies when it comes to water services, so thank you. And I'm delighted that you're not giving up a drop. <laughs> Everybody wants our water, but staff is hanging in there. Very good. Nope. Ed, would you call the roll? Or yes, Mayor. <laughs> the votes? I will call the roll. <laughs> Councilman DeCicio? I'm going to vote for this uh, because I think it's critical enough to keep the debate and the discussion moving forward. I'm still not sold on the 6%, but I'll, I'll take a look at it. Um, I think it's critical that we, you know, we don't take this off the table today. A vote no basically takes it off completely off the table. And I'd like to learn more about it myself. Thank you, Mayor. Yes. Councilwoman Guevara? Yes. Councilwoman Mendoza? Yes. Councilman Nowakowski? Yes. Councilwoman Pastor? Yes. Councilwoman Stark? Yes. Vice Mayor Waring? Mayor Williams. Yes, unanimous. 
Wow, two good job. Twice now. What happened? Thank you. I know. No fight. Unanimous. Good it's, job, guys. Thank you water. for it's the water, <laughs> the water we're drinking. That's it's the quality. Meetings adjourned.